Thank you very much. Good morning. So the theme of my talk is uh, the birth of starlight. And in many ways, this is uh, probably the most exciting scientific adventure since we ourselves are the product of nucleosynthesis in stars. In some sense, uh, it can be our origin. And the facilities that we're building and discussing here at this meeting are motivated in many ways by the search for this moment when the universe switched from being dark uh, to being bathed uh, in starlight. So the last uh, 15 years or so has seen a phenomenal uh, partnership between the Hubble Space Telescope and large ground-based telescopes such as the Keck Observatory and the Very Large Telescope at ESO and others. And here you see uh, in one slide a snapshot of the history of galaxies over a period of about 80 to 90 percent of cosmic history. So, of course, you're familiar with the rich diversity of galaxies today. They fall broadly into two classes, the disk galaxies, the spiral galaxies, and the elliptical galaxies. But even when the universe was uh, about 40% of its present age, at redshifts of one, uh, there's a familiarity, a regularity, perhaps not quite so well developed in the galaxies that are imaged with the Hubble Space Telescope. So you can see there are uh, objects that resemble elliptical galaxies at this early time, and there are galaxies that resemble spiral galaxies as well. But if one pushes back to when the universe was only one to two billion years old, uh, you see the galaxies bear little relation to the galaxies that we see today. They're physically very small. Many of them have multiple components, as if they're assembling by merging with one another, and they are devoid of regularity. And the challenge is to extend this cosmic history back to when the universe was only a few hundred million years old, when we think the universe switched from being dark uh, to being uh, illuminated. So how might we uh, detect and be confident that we found the very first galaxies? Well, of course, galaxies are forming stars, uh, and so the history of the universe is best understood in terms of star formation. So take a box of space, <coughs> integrate all the galaxies within that box of space and estimate the star formation rate per unit volume uh, in that box. And that's what's shown here on a logarithmic scale. And in, in addition to redshift on the axis, uh, we have look back time in billions of years. And you see that the universe today is in decline. Galaxies are running out of gas. And so the star formation rate is declining. It's declined by more than an order of magnitude since the redshift of two. So this period, about 10 billion years ago, when the universe was most active, it's sometimes called cosmic noon. It's the period when galaxies are most energetic and forming their stars at prodigious rate. But thanks to progress with Hubble and large telescopes, we've been able to push back uh, to very high redshift. And what we can see is that the universe at that time uh, is a much sparser place. The galaxies are less numerous, Although they're forming stars uh, actively, uh, they're physically uh, less luminous. And so this luminosity density, or the average star formation rate per unit volume, is declining. So clearly, it's an indication that we're heading towards the beginning, uh, since this drop is so precipitous. But searching for darkness is not an experiment that one can easily do. And so one has to think of another way of looking at the early uh, galaxies. Now, I mentioned in my introduction that galaxies and stars produce nuclear elements, nuclear products, and only the light elements were produced in the Big Bang. And so what you see is that we would expect to find in a pristine galaxy, a, gal a young galaxy would be absent of the heavy elements, magnesium, silicon, calcium, and iron. But unfortunately, looking for these very um, metal-poor galaxies is going to be very challenging. And that's because simulations suggest that these systems are so small that a single supernova, which of course is the primary route to chemical enrichment, will very, very rapidly pollute the entire stellar system, making it uh, metal rich. So this simulation uh, from uh, Britton Smith here at the University of Edinburgh indicates that even within a space of a few tens of millions of years, uh, a primordial galaxy will become chemically enriched. So searching for the galaxies that have not yet developed the chemical elements is likely to be 
uh, a very difficult task. It would require uh, looking at a very large number of objects and finding those very few objects that are in that very narrow time interval uh, when the galaxies are very uh, in, immature and chemically not yet enriched. There is, however, another uh, interesting way to look for the earliest objects, and this is the basic theme of my talk. When the galaxies formed for the first time, <coughs> their stars were very, very hot. They did not have heavy elements, as I mentioned. They're copious producers of ultraviolet light. These ultraviolet photons have the energy capable of ionizing the hydrogen in deep space. So in this cartoon, what you see with time running along the axis is what we call the dark ages, when the universe was primarily just clouds of hydrogen and helium. And then as these clouds collapse and ignite star stellar nuclear reactions at their cores, then this hot ultraviolet light produces ionized bubbles. And these ionized bubbles uh, presumably grow with time as the radiation pe penetrates outwards. More stellar systems collapse, and these ionized bubbles overlap. And the universe transitions from being a neutral gas in deep space to being one that's fully ionized. And we call this process uh, reionization, or cosmic reionization. And my theme really is that this this transition from a neutral gas to an ionized gas, its history and detailed physics is the best way for us to understand when the first galaxies uh, emerged. Now, uh, it's an unfortunate fact that we live in a world with theor theoretical astronomers too, and these theoretical astronomers uh, are often, of course, ahead of the observations, and they've done a very nice simulation here of a cosmic reionization. So what you see is a cube of space. The expansion of the universe is, is accounted for in this simulation, but it's been uh, conveniently removed from the simulation so that it fits on the screen. And what you see is a cube of space. The dark areas are the neutral gas, uh, and the ionized bubbles are the blue regions. And so like Swiss cheese, these ionized bubbles uh, interconnect, and the universe eventually becomes completely ionized. It is rather a slow movie, but this is 300 million years. So this is uh, uh, produced by the group at uh, Stanford University. <clears throat> and the exciting thing is we are now penetrating this reionization era. I like this slide very much because it covers uh, my own personal history. When I was an undergraduate, the most distant object, uh, most distant galaxy was a redshift of about 0.4. Of course, quasars had been discovered in the 1960s, uh, but then with the succession development of eight meter telescopes uh, uh, in the north and southern skies, hemispheres, one sees uh, tremendous progress in extending the most distant objects out to redshifts of initially five and six, and now where we think this reionization is up to redshifts of eight or nine or so. And so we're looking at the universe when it was only a few percent of its present age. And the challenge is to study these objects in detail. And that's why, of course, we're working so hard to produce these new generation facilities. So how might we determine two things? When did reionization end? And when did reionization begin? We have a pretty good idea now of both the answers to, bo answers to both of these questions. So what the key measurement uh, is the neutrality of the intergalactic medium. That is, whether it's atomic in nature or fully ionized. That is, broken into a proton and an electron. And the neutrality can be measured uh, it, by looking at objects in absorption. So, for instance, take a quasar, a very luminous object, and uh, its light passes through the intergalactic medium. So the spectrum of the quasar uh, contains the luminous uh, radiation from the quasar itself, but then the absorption features are all due to clouds of gas along the line of sight. And the Lyman alpha line in absorption from neutral hydrogen tells us the opacity, the amount of neutral gas left in clumps along the line of sight all the way to the Earth. And this test uh, tells us that something interesting begins to happen as one goes back to redshifts of about six or so, you can see the amount of absorption 
in Lyman Alpha rises slowly and then seems to uh, rise more rapidly as one reaches this redshift of six. So this was the first indication that the universe is beginning to change at a redshift of six. As one goes further back, it's partially ionized, perhaps. This technique uh, can't be extended very much beyond a redshift of six. Unfortunately, we're still missing these luminous sources. So the quasar, the highest redshift quasar, is still a redshift of seven, despite considerable effort to find more distant objects. And I want to point out that it's an insensitive test. Only one part in a thousand of neutral hydrogen would completely uh, extinguish the light from the quasar. So the dynamic range in this test uh, is pretty limited. Uh, a more interesting test is to look at the galaxies and the light that is emits in this Lyman alpha line, but this time in emission. So this line of hydrogen is a very important line. It's uh, the most common line seen in star-forming galaxies. A galaxy is forming stars. The stars heat the hydrogen gas that is the reservoir of future stars. That gas glows, and as much as 6 or 7% of the radiation from an early galaxy could be in this one spectrum line. But it is a resonant line. That is, it goes from n equals 2 to n equals 1. So it's very easily scattered by neutral gas. So if a galaxy is sitting in the dark region of neutral gas, the Lyman alpha photon will not get very far. It'll be scattered. If it's in one of those ionized bubbles and in the blue region in that simulation, then the Lyman alpha photon can travel unimpeded through the ionized region. And when it gets to the edge of the ionized region, it's Doppler shifted by the expansion of the universe out of resonance. So we would expect a sudden drop in the visibility of this line as we penetrate into the dark ages. So using the Keck telescope, my colleagues and I over many years did a big survey measuring the frequency with which we see this emission line uh, in galaxies selected from uh, Hubble Space Telescope images. And what you see uh, is that uh, up to a redshift of six, the line can be quite common. As much as 50% of the galaxies show this prominent spectrum line. But as one penetrates uh, out to redshifts of eight or so, the, the fraction drops precipitously. And this is very important additional evidence uh, that the universe is beginning to be become neutral uh, beyond a redshift of six or so. So I think these two pieces of evidence uh, give us some confidence that the transition ended at a redshift of six. But of course, the much more exciting question is when did it begin? Because that is the hint of when the very first galaxies arrived. And we will be one. Uh, twist to this story uh, following Hitoshi Moriyama's talk yesterday, uh, since these Lyman alpha lines uh, are prominent in the ionized regions uh, with big cameras like the hypersuprime camera and the prime focus spectrograph that will follow, uh, one can chart the angular distribution of these bubbles. So one will be able to trace their extent and that will give us physical information on how, how old those bubbles are what is the nature of the ionizing sources. So that's going to come very, very soon. So the trick to understanding the beginning of reionization is that the electrons appear in deep space for the first time. So remember, the beginning of the reionization era, we think, is associated with the birth of galaxies. And those galaxies break the hydrogen into a proton and electron. So there's a column of electrons all the way from the beginning of reionization to the present day. And viewed through the microwave background, these electrons scatter and polarize the light from the microwave background. So the strength of this polarization signal, detected by, uh, first by the WMAP satellite and now more accurately by the Planck uh, mission, tells us the mean redshift where this transition occurred and importantly, the duration of the reionization era. And the exciting development this year is that they have measured very accurately the extent of this reionization period. And their claim is that the models that are most consistent 
uh, with the measurement that they make, which you can see is quite significant, is that reionization began at about a redshift of 12 or 10 uh, and finished at redshift 6, consistent with the earlier work that I showed. This is a bit of a surprise. This is a very fast period. It's a few hundred million years, about 400 million years, and it's later than perhaps many theorists would have expected. But it's very exciting for those of us building experimental facilities because it brings this period into uh, observational reach. We are already probing out to redshifts of 10. So deep images with the Hubble Space Telescope, such as this one, the ultra-deep field, and slightly shallower but wider area surveys like the Candles survey are complemented by gravitational lensing. So here we are 100 years after the development of general relativity and one of the most exciting and observationally important predictions of general relativity is the bending of light by massive objects. They can act as focusing lenses magnifying galaxies from the reionization era. So Hubble is investing significantly in looking at these uh, clusters of galaxies in the foreground that act as cosmic lenses, magnifying, and in many cases, rendering triple images, A, B, and C, of the same background galaxy at a redshift of 10 or so. So these two very complementary techniques, deep imaging in small areas, say 10 days a, in a single spot with the Hubble Space Telescope, or the advantage of boosting background objects by the natural lensing power of foreground clusters are two very different techniques. But they give us a, a census uh, that is pretty reliable, and the two methods agree very well. So here's that diagram I showed you before, but now we're focusing on the nature of this decline. And it's certainly true that the error bars are still quite large, but the drop is very substantial. There was some excitement a few years ago. There was some evidence that perhaps uh, the drop started to steepen uh, as one went beyond a redshift of eight, which would signal perhaps some evidence of the beginning. Uh, but the most recent data suggests that the slope of this decline is pretty, pretty, uh, is pretty continuous out to redshifts of 10 or so. So you can take this population of galaxies you can uh, predict approximately what their ionizing properties would be, and you can reproduce uh, the signal that is seen uh, by the Planck satellite, consistent with their claim that the universe was neutral at a redshift of 12 and fully ionized at redshift 6. So if you remember one thing, it's that if this picture is correct, the first galaxies are within reach. They're really not that far behind a redshift of of 10 to 15 or so. But to clinch this argument, we actually need to understand whether there's enough radiation coming from these galaxies to be consistent with this picture. So ionization is the product of the number of galaxies, not just the luminous ones, but all of them per unit volume, the nature of the stars within the galaxies, how many hot ones there are that uh, produce the number of ionizing photons, and then the fraction of photons that can get out of the galaxy. And as we'll see, all of these are areas of intense investigation uh, at the moment. Let's start with the integrated abundance of galaxies. Of course, when we look at a curve like this, we're only sensitive to galaxies down to some luminosity limit. Even with 10 days imaging with the Hubble Space Telescope, it's clear that we're missing some portion of galaxies. Galaxies don't all have the same luminosity, and so we're missing the intrinsically faint ones. But this is where the gravitational lensing is so exciting, because it boosts the subluminous galaxies, you know, the feeble ones, the, if you like, the Icelandic galaxies that are subluminous <laughs> and feeble, that are boosted in and somewhat, you know, become so important in their contribution to reionization. And the exciting thing is when this frontier field program that's being undertaken by Space Telescope, it will eventually look at six clusters, and it will integrate uh, the luminosity density to a precision of better than 30%, which is, uh, which is in this area of science extremely, uh, extremely good. So how much, how much ionizing radiation emerges depends on the nature of the galaxies. We're stymied at the moment by the lack of gathering power 
of our facilities. All Hubble can do at these early redshifts, high redshifts, is to measure the colors of the galaxies. But the colors of the galaxies are somewhat, um, um, give us amb uh, an ambiguous evidence of the nature of the ionizing spectrum. It's certainly true if the galaxies are metal poor and young, uh, they will have steep ultraviolet continua, they'll have a large ionizing output. If they're metal enriched, they'll be redder and they'll have a more modest uh, ionizing output. But, you know, it depends on so many things. The chemical composition, whether there's dust in the early universe, even our physical understanding of massive stars at early times isn't clear. So a much more promising tool is spectroscopy. And spectroscopy tells us uh, that the ionizing spectrum can be probed with lines, emission lines that are in the ultraviolet and elsewhere that have very high ionization potentials. So the presence of these lines can test, for example, whether the radiation is coming from metal poor stars, metal rich stars, or even black holes, non-thermal radiation. We know there are quasars at redshift seven. It's perfectly reasonable that there should be black holes and non-thermal contributions at higher redshift. So with the MOS fire spectrograph on Keck, we're managing to begin scraping the surface on measuring these lines. We're seeing some of these lines now at uh, high redshifts, at redshift seven, this is the carbon four doublet at 1548, the carbon three uh, doublet at 1909. And these tell us that the ionizing spectrum does indeed seem to be harder. These, are, these early galaxies are probably metal poor and they have a higher radiation output. Maybe they have active nuclei uh, in their centers. If we can get more data, that will be possible to test. And then the final challenge is, how does this radiation get out of the galaxy? The galaxy has gas clouds. Those gas clouds contain hydrogen. That's the fuel for the later stars that will form and end up in the present day universe. Uh, and these, uh, these uh, neutral hydrogen clouds will scatter the radiation and occult it uh, as it emerges. And it turns out to reionize the universe, we need at least 10% of the radiation to get out. And it's very difficult to make this measurement. The theorists are very confident that when the universe was young, these galaxies were small, star formation was vigorous and burst-like, and that it will blast holes in these hydrogen clouds so that this ionizing radiation will get out. But it's almost impossible at the moment to make measurements uh, that will test this. One can certainly look at absorption lines of the neutral gas and see how much neutral gas covers the galaxy, whether it's porous or not. But at the moment, we can only do that uh, for galaxies at lower redshift and by stacking many spectra, even with telescopes like the Keck telescope. So let me turn briefly to ALMA. ALMA is, of course, uh, the current state of the art in, um, in big ambitious facilities. And it gives us two very important new stories to tell. First is the question of whether dust is produced in the early universe. Dust, of course, is produced in supernova and evolved stars, and it complicates the in, in, in interpretation of measurements from Hubble uh, and Spitzer. At uh, high redshift, Hubble and Spitzer ref, uh, respectively look at the ultraviolet and optical regions of the spectrum. And so if there's any dust, it complicates the interpretation. Of course, dust is also an indication of early chemical enrichment. So here's one very exciting development. This is a detection of a dust continuum in a galaxy at a redshift of seven and a half, telling us that there are dust clouds being produced well within the reionization era. So it's gonna be very important to quantify uh, the probability that a galaxy has dust as one goes to higher redshift. So this is certainly a very exciting program uh, for ALMA. ALMA can also do spectroscopy, and one can see uh, high ionization lines, such as uh, forbidden oxygen-3, 88 microns, recently seen uh, also in the reionization era, that support the measurements that we've been making with MOS fire on Keck using ultraviolet, uh, rest frame ultraviolet lines. So the future is, I think, really amazingly exciting. We have James Webb Space Telescope uh, within two years. We have a succession of ground, giant ground-based telescopes uh, that will give us access uh, to the redshift range out to 
10 and 11 or so for uh, detailed spectroscopy. Let me comment on the synergy between ground and space because I think it will evolve, at least in this particular area uh, of science. James Webb Space Telescope uh, has a spectrograph, NERSPEC. NERSPEC will allow us to probe for the first time the wavelength range beyond two and a half microns. We can't do sensitive spectroscopy beyond two and a half microns from the ground. This will enable us to reach uh, the rest frame optical spectrum lines that are the bedrock of measuring the composition and the ionization nature of early galaxies. So all of those measurements that I mentioned where we can look at the radiation spectrum and the composition of the gas will be possible. And these lines are all within reach within the redshift window that is now encapsulated by the reionization history. But you know, um, adaptive optics from the ground uh, is extremely important. These galaxies are physically very small. So what we've shown here is the physical size of a typical galaxy from a stack of objects in the ultra deep field. And you can see they'd be unresolved by the James Webb Space Telescope. So the large ground-based telescopes with adaptive optics paradoxically have better imaging capability in this area. So we have this reversal. We're used to thinking of Hubble producing images and the workhorse spectrographs on ground-based telescopes doing the spectroscopy. But paradoxically in this area, James Webb's primary role, of course it will take beautiful images, but it will also uniquely do the spectroscopy that's necessary in a wavelength range that we can't reach. Uh, from the ground, whereas the ground-based telescopes have exquisite angular resolution, better than James Webb, and that will give us tremendous advantages uh, in uh, studying uh, the intrinsically faint population. So let me summarize. My key uh, statement is that understanding the role of galaxies in this reionization process is the best route for finding these uh, early galaxies. We have this window now from redshift 10 and 12 down to 6. Uh, and the, we have excellent prospects for studying the galaxies in this region in great detail. We can measure their chemical composition. We can see whether they have black holes. We can see uh, whether their st uh, stellar populations are similar or different from those that we see likewise. So it's going to be a very exciting era. And spectroscopy and imaging from James Webb and the large telescopes will directly probe this era. There are some challenges. It's always useful to remember that this late reionization comes in, in entirely from this measurement from the Planck satellite. It's going to be very important to verify that. This is the main evidence for this window in time where we see these early galaxies developing. We need to confirm that um, most of the radiation, uh, at least a significant fraction of it, greater than 10 percent, can get out of the galaxy. At the moment, it's very difficult to make this measurement. It will require the gra large ground-based telescopes to be sure. And the exciting thing is the interplay between star formation and the development of black holes. We've seen over the last 10 years how uh, active galactic nuclei and star formation are intimately connected at lower redshift. There's no reason to expect that that's any different at high redshift. And then finally, the key role of ALMA in probing the early dust formation. So I'll just conclude by saying I couldn't have given this talk uh, even a year ago. The subject is moving so rapidly. It's a very, very exciting time. And for those of you who are working on any of the facilities that I mentioned, this is really an amazing, exciting time. Thank you very much.